Thank you very much for the invitation. I very much appreciate that. Um, now, I asked Daniel what he wants me to talk about. Um, options would have been variant, uh, which was uh, dominating my C++ life for a while, reflection, or the thing where we totally disagree. And he chose not the thing that where we totally disagree, because I would have convinced all of you, and then he would have had problems. But instead, I'm going to talk about reflection. So uh, actually, this talk is fairly simple. Um, done. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> so the presentation is actually online. Uh, I show not a lot of code. But in case you want to have a look at it, I try to keep the URL short so you can type it in if you have a laptop. There are very few laptops here. That's very uncommon for my environment. Um, but you can find it online. I show this URL again in case you want to bring out your device now. So I'm working with CERN uh, since many years now. And um, CERN is not a company. So I don't make, you know, don't make money or something. We burn money. And we, <laughs> what we do with it is research. We're doing fundamental research. We're trying to understand what matter is. We're trying to understand why the hell we only understand 5% of the universe when it comes to mass, which is a disaster. 95% of, of the universe is completely not understood. Um, we have 50 million lines of C++, so we are a big user of C++. And we do lots of fun things. We have one exabyte of serialized C++ objects. I don't think anybody else has this. There are lots of, not lots of, there are a handful of companies which have more data, but they don't serialize C++ objects. So I think this is fairly unique, actually. And I mentioned already before, we have a C++ interpreter, which is super nice, not just for interpreting C++. The real magic is that we have a Python binding, where on the Python side, you know, you can type foo.bar, and then the, the, uh, the Python layer says, hey, uh, C++ interpreter, somebody, somebody's trying to call bar on, on that foo thing. What does that mean? Like, I, I don't care. I'm just Python. You figure that one out. And then the C++ interpreter says, ah, sure, here you go. Um, so that's, that's really awesome. It's once, uh, you know, it's, it's unique. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. Um, and we really love to see more people from Spain as students and fellows and staff. So uh, please remember this. It's not difficult to remember, right? Jobs of CERN is, uh, And also, if you know my name, uh, my email address is fairly simple. I'm Axel. Hello. <laughs> okay, and I did mention that the talk is online. So if you have your device out now, then uh, this is where it is. Okay, so maybe you might ask, why am I here? Um, the reason is that I'm uh, doing, I'm responsible for the, for the uh, program that allows us to serialize C++ objects at CERN. Um, I'm the project lead of this, and it's used for big data analysis. Um, I'm a member of the C++ ISO committee since eight years now. Um, and I'm one of the authors of the Reflection TS. Yeah, and I like Madrid, so thank you. Okay, last chance. <laughs> so this is what the talk is going to be. We are starting now, right? Everything before doesn't count time-wise. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to get, introduce you to reflection. Who knows? Uh, who of you knows reflection? So that's worthwhile being introduced then. Excellent. I'll talk about C++ and zero overhead, the status of the reflection, <coughs> TS, and the design, and then what's coming up. Does that sound re reasonable? So let's get started. Reflection is about uh, querying your code, okay? Converting your code, your program code, into data, basically. Um, we are taking a type and we are trying to understand what it means. And if we are lucky, we also get the reverse operation where we have information about code and we are creating code from it. That actually exists in other languages as well. Uh, the implementation is always messy, which is why we don't have to deal with it. We only deal with the specification. 
For Python, that's nice. You just do dot underscore underscore dict underscore underscore, and that is what you get. We can zoom into this. Um, as you can see, it contains all this stuff that os.statResult uh, contains, right? That makes up this type. Oh, I see my microphone is wandering around. Let me see if I can fix this. <coughs> Let me know if you can't hear me, and I'll just take the, the hand microphone. Okay, so what, what this contains is data and information about data and function members, and it does so recursively. So if there is a base class or anything, it will just collect all of those. And with this, you can access names right here. That's the name, right? And the types. So you have, I don't know, somewhere here's the type, for example, I guess. Now, use cases for reflection um, are, I want to have a monitor. It's here, but that's, uh, that's too far. Oh, well. So I have to turn around, sorry. Um, use cases are serialization. We talked about this. So you have a struct or a class, and you're trying to store the value of the data members, and then ideally be able to read them back and put them into the struct or class object. GUIs are actually also candidates for reflection because you could just collect all the getters and setters and then you create uh, GUI elements from that. Uh, QT's uh, mock is sort of doing that as well. Then we could use RPC, remote procedure calls. You uh, define your protocol through C++ classes, through the functions it offers. Uh, many people want to take enum constants and take the names and make them strings so that they can be used in a different context. That's a reflection operation. Logging, of course, is an obvious case, and then maybe even documentation. Uh, you can look at the members of classes and generate HTML pages from this. Okay, so does C++ have reflection at the moment? It does, actually. It has two different kinds. There is type info, which is a runtime type information. So it's something that, that uh, um, you can do with different results at runtime. It does not offer a lot. It offers, um, it offers an operator equal, and you can get a name out. So this thing here, for example. The thing itself is actually um, not specified by the standard, so it's nothing you can really rely on. It's different on different platforms. Um, yeah, and you will never be able to find out what's inside a std string with this thing. Now, as I said, it's a runtime thing. So if you have a, if you call type ID on a, on a pointer, and this pointer points to an object with, which has at least one virtual function, then actually type ID will be able to tell you which class this object is pointing to. So it will not only look at the type of the pointer, but it will actually be able to determine the derived type. So that makes it totally runtime, right? Because at runtime, this might, these might be different types. Now, there's also compile time. We have this in, in the type traits. There is, in, is enum, is pointer, and they tell you something about the type, right? So it's reflection. Uh, you have introspection, but it's really minimal. It's like, um, are you empty? Well, <laughs> I have something, so I'm not empty. Fine, I have no idea what you have, but okay, you're not empty. Um, we have is default constructible, which tells you something about the constructors. It's also not bad, but that's about it. Now, this is compile time. So the questions you ask are going to be answered at compile time, when, when the compiler looks at your code. Um, and the operations are actually limited to types. You can't do this on objects. So if you, if you summarize the state before the reflection TS, then you can see that we do have runtime and compile time reflection. The big deficit of the runtime reflection is that we actually need to generate symbols so basically part of your .o files and thus your shared libraries and so on, just in case somebody will ever ask anything about runtime type information. So that's costly and it's violating the approach of C++ that you should only pay for something that you're actually going to use. We're going to get into this in a bit. And type traits and type info, both of them have really limited information that they provide. 
there is, for example, no way to, to serialize any objects based on this. Okay, so I mentioned this zero overhead thing before. The idea is that in C++ you only pay for what you're going to use. Uh, possibly with high compile times, but the point is at runtime, things should be as cheap as possible. The compile time overhead actually matches what C++ wants much, much better. And then once you have this compile time facility, everybody's free, like you are free to build your own runtime library on top of this. Right? So the idea is we provide the functionality at compile time, and then people can implement the runtime thing on top. So let's look at, at reflection. We call this static reflection, and this is the thing. Okay? Whatever in the end we're going to get precisely, it's very likely going to look like this. Nobody is objecting this anymore. So you have a keyword, reflexpr, and then you have something in parentheses. Now, before we go into the details, let me give you the state of this thing. It's a technical specification, which means it's not the real thing. It's not part of the C++ standard, not part of 20, not part of 23. It's sort of a side track. Um, modules, concepts, and coroutines, those were all technical specifications, if I remember correctly, and they're now merged into 20 coming from a TS. The TS motivates uh, vendors, compiler, and library authors to implement this feature so that we can then try it out and complain which things don't work and what's missing. So the goal is really to collect feedback and part of the reason why I'm giving this presentation is because I'm trying to, to, to announce to you that there will be implementations of this and I'm, I'm trying to, to figure out whether you have good ideas of trying this out uh, different use cases, and then collecting feedback from you in the coming years. Now, this TS's life is long. Like any big thing in C++, it takes years. It started in 2014 with a thing that was 130 pages long. It was terrible, and everybody agreed, there's no way we are going to even look at this because the author didn't even show up. But then a, um, a friend of ours from the committee was like, but you know, it, it's, it's not, like, it's terrible, but it's not that bad, actually. Maybe you could have a look and like present it, just, just performer. So like, okay, fine, let me present it performer. And hey, this was actually much better than I thought. It was just really, really big because it was thinking about the whole thing. Like the whole thing was designed in these 230 pages. So part of our job was to trim this down to a minimal viable product something that we could agree on, because that's easier done on a couple of pages than on 130, of course, and then make progress with this. And that's what we did. We had a couple of alternative proposals, but actually the committee converged on this one, on the one that is now in the TS. We have opened it last year. It was already, already voted on, so this is super fast in the end. Um, and now it's going to be published in 2019. That's the expectation. And then hopefully the first implementations will maybe already show up in 2019 or maybe 2020, we'll see. <coughs> so, what are we talking about? What is in there? I hope now I have your attention. Everybody wants to know, well, yeah. So, okay, fine, we've seen this, right? That's what we can do. But what is this, actually? It's not an operator, it's a specifier. What you get is a type, okay? You get a, a new type out. We say this thing down here, this type that it returns, is a meta object, right? Because it's sort of on a meta level. It's, it's describing something. Um, the thing is said to reflect the string here. So this thing is reflecting std string. And std string is the base level or the reflected entity. Okay, just to introduce the words we're using. Now, actually, we are using templates to make sense of this type. So you, we can ask questions on the type that is returned by the specifier. We can ask, for example, is that a final class? And that's a const expert value, of course. So we can use it in if const expert as an example. 
I'm giving you the examples here as, as short as possible, as compact as possible. Of course, there's always a CD involved, right? Um, and actually, um, we have stood reflect for everything that I'm going to talk about here for the, for the TS. Actually, it's stood experimental reflect, but that's making it even longer, so I'll skip that part. Um, so these things are in stood reflect. Um, and these need to be distinguished from whatever is in std itself. Sometimes we're actually using the same names. This thing here is operating on a class that you got from the reflex per specifier, and this one is operating on a regular type. So, that, so the, the reflex per is a new keyword. It's a type specifier just like decal type or what do I have there, type ID. Um, Type ID is a bad example, but decal type is a good example because it's also returning a type. It's representing a type. And then you even have, before I showed you how you can have a template which gives you a value, right? But you can have templates that give you access to even more meta objects. And here we have one of these examples. So get data members is giving you a sequence, a collection of things of types that represent the data members of string. <laughs> we can now look into the implementation of the standard library. Now all of this is driven by concepts. Concepts are the fundamental ingredient to all of the, the reflection TS. Um, whenever you have an operation, that operation needs to be available because the type returns sort of by the reflex per specifier needs to satisfy some of these concepts. And there is a certain hierarchy, um, so something that's a type is automatically named, so you can ask it for its name and so on. The thing is that the types represented by reflexper are actually undefined. They do not have a definition, so you can't instantiate an object from this because that doesn't matter. We just care about them being a, an entity, a thing. Um, and they are unnamed, just similar to lambdas. So you can spell out their name yourself, but you don't have to. You just hand them around. But they do satisfy concepts which define the operations that they provide. And so, for example, if you do this on a std string, then you get an alias because std string is a type def, right? And it's a type. <laughs> so you get these two, the operations from these two concepts. If you reflect this, then you get a function call expression. Yeah, so the thing is, why don't we just reflect functions themselves? Well, because that's actually not well defined in C++. C++ is good with specifying the function through a call, but it's very bad in specifying a function if you don't actually call it. So we just decided we take the call itself. And if you do this on Arano, you get a variable. Now, concepts are really beautiful. They're so simple. So we had actually, within the committee, we had the question, uh, but how do you then find out if something is an enum? Don't you miss, like, you're missing some operations there. No, oh, you just do this. Like, you can use a, a concept in a Boolean context, and it gives you true or false. Okay, so I was referring to data members, and if you're a committee member, <laughs> then you go pale in your face, all white, you start to shiver, and you get really, really scared. Why? Well, this gives you an idea. There is get public data members. That sounds kind of safe. But there's also the version which does not have the public in it. So we actually get to look into the private members of classes. And then we have accessible data members, which look at what can I see from this class at the point where I invoke, invoke reflexper on it. So if you're in a friend context, for example. So yes, we are breaking access control, but we are reflection. We can do these things. You can't do serialization without looking at the private data members. So, in the beginning, we had a big discussion on this, but we managed to convince the committee that if we want to have reflection as a useful facility, we need to be able to look into the private data members. 
Yeah, and otherwise, if your company forbids you from using get data members to look into everything, then get accessible data members might be a good way out. So you get friended or uh, you derive and then you can look into things. Another thing we, we fought for, these are all really different topics that never happened in C++, right? So they all had to be, um, the, the committee needed to be convinced on each of them separately. Names. Names is a big thing. We never agreed on any authoritative spelling of names within the committee. Now we did. It's a minimal version, but it gets us there. We need names for, for reading what's stored, right? When you store something, you want to store the type of the object. That's essential. And then when you read it back, you need to know what the type is. We need names for schema evolution. Um, this is something that you only ever know if you do this in practice. If you have a class definition, you store all the members to file. Now, two years past, the class definition have, has changed and now has an extra member. How are you going to read the old data back? You need member names to be able to identify which member goes where. That's really a key ingredient in any stable serialization mechanism. So we need names for members. We need function names for RPC, for example, and parameter names for, for graphical user interfaces. All of these things are essential for good reflection. Now we actually have two different ways of naming things. We have the thing that, that we agreed on as a committee. That's get name. It's not much, but it's something, okay? If you have a stood vector of something, then get name is going to tell you vector. Okay, fine. It, it's a start, right? The real thing is get display name. That gives you something as spelled in the code. That's the hope. We can't actually standardize this, so we are relying on the implementation to do something reasonable there. They could, in principle, give something cryptic, like they do for type info, for the name of the type info, but we all agree that this isn't going to happen. We expect something like spelled in code. Did you get this one? I love this one. It's fantastic. Um, okay. Another thing that we fought for in the, within the committee is ODR violations. The thing is, if you have code, then the goal is that C++ make, has the same meaning to this code any way you look at it. Whether you look at it here or there or in a different translation unit or later in the translation unit, it should always have the same meaning, right? That's the goal. That doesn't work well if your function parameter names change because you can have redeclarations of the same function with different parameter names, and you're asking the function, what's, what's the parameter name? That doesn't work well if you want to ask, does this parameter have a default value? That can change over time. You want to know whether a class was de declared with class or struct, that can also change over time. So these are things where, again, we had to to convince the committee that it's worthwhile to, to do this compromise where if you have a consistent way of spelling this, then you get a consistent answer. So the don't do that refers to don't ask this question unless you know that your code is doing the right thing because otherwise you don't really know what's going to happen. We were looking before at the, uh, the data members, and I told you it's a collection of, of types. Now, these types are all different, right? Because they describe each of the data members, and so the description needs to differ. So these are different types. <coughs> By definition, then, that's very similar to a tuple. He fell asleep. He didn't hear it. Um, but of course, what we really want is that each iteration over this, these tuple elements is dealing with different types. So what we need really is a heterogeneous for loop, something that allows us to iterate over the tuple and then have a different for loop body every time. Hey, guy, you know this one? Can you read it out loud for us? Yeah. 
I don't know. It's terrible. So don't. don't <laughs> so anyway, we are going to have four dot 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 at some point. That's what we are hoping for, and that allows us to have an iteration <coughs> over heterogeneous tuple elements. And each of the for loop iterations is actually going to be a different sort of like a template specialization. And this is super handy also for the object sequence that I was referring to before. OK, the problem is this is based on templates. Now, it's something that can work now, right? We can actually make this work now. We can implement it now, but it's templates. We don't like templates. The whole meta programming with templates and, and underscore V and stuff is, is not nice. So what we really want is just having values, and you call functions with these values, and you get new values back. That's the goal. That's called consexpr, and that's the future that we are currently working on. So the three options that we are currently have on the table is the TS with its templates. Then we have something that is sort of using an object-oriented approach where you get an object out, a meta object out, and you call a function on it. But that's the member function thing that uh, Guy pointed out is uh, you know, easily excessive. And it's actually also difficult to move forward um, if we have changes in the language. Or we use free functions. So we just pass an object, a meta object, to a function. We're actually going to merge these two letter ones. That's the plan. Um, we have nothing written down yet, but we have the ideas in our, in our heads. And if we manage to, to convince the committee that this is the way to go, that assumes that we actually have an idea of what to do, which we don't have yet, right? It's not written down yet. Then this will have a huge impact. We believe that this will actually change the way that we do const expert programming in C++. And that's great. I mean, we are, we are using reflection just as a test case for writing const expert libraries. That's basically what it is. But that also sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? Um, so we do want const expert value-based reflection instead of templates. We need a couple of things in the language before we can make this happen. And because it's a test case, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. We need to do a lot of things. Um, luckily, the specification of the value-based, const expert value-based reflection and the template one that we currently have in the TS is super similar. The people who do the wording, who reviewed my wording to be precise in the committee, were like, oh, why do we need to go through all your terrible wording if in the end we just throw it away? I was like, no, 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 no. You will look at this again. Even though we are going to have cons expert reflection and not the template-based one, the definition of what get name returns is going to be identical. Many of the things are basically identical. So the functionality we provide now, we can just copy one-to-one -one onto the cons expert implementation. I announced that I'll talk a little bit about reification. Actually, I'm, I'm just giving you a very superficial um, uh, look at this. There are several possible approaches. We're, to we're totally not there yet. Okay? There is no solid proposal on reification yet, in my point of view. Um, there is the idea to use an operator, for example, type name on a, on a meta object. Um, there's the idea to use const expert blocks. You might have heard about meta classes. All of these things play a role there. All of them allow you to generate code from reflection data. None of this is part of the Reflection TS, and we'll see whether this will be part of C++23. I would hope so, but even without, we can do lots of things like um, serialization and whatnot. OK, so to conclude, we are going to have Reflection in C++, even though for now it's a technical specification. And that allows us, as in the committee, to agree on what it actually should be doing. 
well, how far we can go with reflection. We have a minimal viable product for many of the use cases. And the implementations are coming. So I really hope that you find a chance to just play around with it. Figure out whether something that was always itching you with C++ can be done with reflection. Try it out. And please tell me how it works for you. The target, of course, is cons expert based reflection for 23, but as I said, it's a lot of work still. So I don't know exactly what will happen if we don't manage to get all the different ingredients done by, say, 22. Um, so, in my point of view, there is, there's, it's very hard to argue that um, we should prevent the community from using reflection, which, in my point of view, if you have it in a TS, then no company is going to use it. So basically, we prevent the community from using it. It's hard to argue this if we have something that we could merge just because we're waiting for the better thing out there. But we'll see. We're not there yet. So to conclude, um, make some noise. If you want this, then talk to your GCC folks. They have a mailing list. To your client folks, they have a mailing list. Um, and tell them, hey, uh, how far are you with the implementation? <laughs> and like, ah, yeah, mm, right. We uh, need to find somebody who actually does it. Um, but you know, we need to make noise. We need to make them aware that we really, really want this as a community. Because it does change dramatically the way we are going to use C++. We don't really know what it's going to bring. When I wrote the variant, I thought, hey, it's just a nice way of getting rid of this stupid union that everybody's using the wrong way. People don't destruct things, the old thing, before assigning the new one and so on. It's, it's terrible. I just wanted to have a replacement. But then I saw the talks that people did on this, like, whoa, a replacement for polymorphism? That's insane. And here with reflection, people expect this to happen. They know that reflection opens up a whole new dimension to C++. We don't know yet what it will bring. Though. So we want your feedback for your use cases. It's by the committee, but it's by the community and for the community. Um, I'm doing this as part of the community. So please join in and participate. OK, thanks a lot. As I said, we do fun things. Please come over. Um, I would love to see some of you. We have time for some questions. And we have some questions, actually. That's how our talks look like. Nobody ever pays attention. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you don't have laptops. Hi, thank you a lot for your talk. Um, I'm curious about why do you need the reflex, reflex, whatever how you pronounce it, uh, keyword? Like, why, why can't you like make the questions directly about the type you're interested in, and you need this intermediate type in between? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, so you have this refl expert uh, keyword, which is used to give you a different representation of your type about, um, and you can then ask questions to yes. this new type. Why can't you make the questions directly to your original type? Like say, is class, uh, you had an example where actually there is potentially an is class already. Why cannot use is final, get members, etc., directly on, uh, on a regular type? Yes, I think I know the answer. So this is how our work life looks like. We enjoy the sun, and uh, over there is the Mont Blanc, and we have good coffee over there. Um, yeah. Anyway, so going back to the answer. <laughs> the answer is not here. It's here. If you have a, a meta object, then you can actually hand this around. It's a representation of the original type. Um, but you can hop from it to other meta objects. So now we can write a library that takes a meta object and does operations on it. If we were to only do this on the underlying type itself, it would be much harder to write these meta libraries. It's, it's handy to have to go to a world which is just describing the underlying types.
Okay, any other question? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I am just a very, very small, very practical question uh, that jumped to my mind when I saw your ODR violation slide. Um, we have the habit to um, declare all parameters as non-const in the declaration because we think it's up to the implementation whether or not the parameter is actually const and it may change any time and it doesn't have to change the header file. Um, so uh, parameters in the header file are always non-const and parameters in the implementation are sometimes const whenever, they, whenever possible. Um, do you have any recommendation? Should we change this habit in anticipation of reflection? So this was actually something that uh, there was discussed and I, I wouldn't go as far as to have a recommendation whether that's good coding style or not. Um, I know it exists. Um, the trick is to use reflection on your headers. If you're doing this, then, then you're good, right? Because you will only see ever anything consistent in a consistent way. Um, so I, I would assume that for your case, this should be sort of okay. Last question. Hi, hello. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, this reflection is at compile time or at runtime. I would understand that it's at compile time, but I'm not sure. Yes, it's compile time. Exactly. And you only pay for the parts that you're actually using. So there is no additional symbols, there's no code generated. It's just the compiler that you're talking to through the reflection TS. So if you have a polymorphic class, you actually cannot, uh, for example, understand the members on or anything. If you have, for example, a, a message type that's a generic message type, you cannot use uh, reflection to serialize it. That is correct. Okay. The way to go is to have a runtime library that is built on top of the static reflection that is providing the hooks to, to runtime to then say, oh, I'm actually looking at this type, say with type ID, right? Mm -hmm. And then do the right branching and, and figuring out how to serialize this. Oh. Okay, thank you. I know this works. We are doing this since 20 years. So. Okay, so Axel, we don't have time for more questions, so thank you well, very much. I'll stick around, so yeah. thanks.